After 14 years, the Emperor Nero's reign had come to a bloody end. Beset by revolution, his death would start a series of events that would turn the years 69 AD into one of the most chaotic in history. Nero's death ended the Julio-Claudian dynasty of the Caesars. With his demise, a massive power vacuum was created, consuming everything and everyone in its path. Fueled by greed and a lust for power, the great leaders of the Empire sought to vie for the greatest prize in existence, absolute power over the Roman world. Upon learning that he had been declared emperor, Galba lingered in Spain, the province in which he was governor, for another month. Finally departing with his legions to Rome, he passed through the territory of the empire he now ruled, not as its emperor, but almost like a conqueror, exacting revenge on his enemies and killing anyone who would not submit to his authority. New legionaries, raised by Nero to fight Galba, presented themselves to their new emperor, hoping to have their position secured by their master. Instead of recognizing these men, he ordered his legions to attack them, killing thousands before finally acknowledging them on the condition that they agreed to undergo the ancient and abandoned practice of decimation. Having drawn lots, every tenth man was executed. By the time Galba reached Rome, this new emperor's reputation was in blood-soaked ruins. He even turned on some of the supporters that had helped him rise to power in the first place. Many men in Rome and the provinces began to ask themselves the most terrible question of all. If Galba can be emperor, why can't I? On January the 1st, 69 AD, the legions of the Rhine refused to recognize their oaths to Galba. Instead, they declared their leader, Vitellius, emperor. The civil war which would consume Rome for a year had arrived. Galba, in Rome, was overwhelmed with this news. Already struggling to hold on to power in the city after his terrible ascendancy, he sought to inject young energy into his reign. Believing a popular successor would help him tighten his grip, he elevated a young senator as his heir. There was only one problem with this decision. Many in the Senate had kept Galba in power under the hope that they could be made heir to the childless emperor. With the choice now made, the pathway to power was closed to them. Above all others, Otho wanted that job. Really, really badly. Since Galba had arrived in Rome, Otho had tried everything he could to gain the new emperor's favor. Deeply in debt, through gifts and favors purchased in the pursuit of his dream, he had now been passed over. Otho was enraged at this perceived slight. He quickly helped turn the last of the loyal holdouts against Galba. Many men, just as greedy and as ambitious as Otho, were furious as well at the elevation of this young nobody, the position of heir of the greatest prize in the world. Galba was then subsequently murdered by his Praetorian guards. He had been frugal with his guardsmen, and Otho had made them promises of wealth that they had felt they were owed. Having stoked their greed, Otho now rose to become the emperor with the aid of his loyal supporters and a healthy, well-placed bribe. It was now that he discovered just how bad the empire's finances, in fact, were. Galba had not been cheap. He had been prudent. The depths of Nero's years of mismanagement were unmistakable. And now there were two emperors of Rome. Otho tried to quell the fires raging in the north and achieve a settlement peacefully, However, Vitalius and his men wanted the Empire, and nothing would stand against them. Vitalius had at his command, well, at his general's command, the most powerful legions of the Empire. Veteran legionaries forged in the wars against Germany. Otho rallied the legions of Dalmatia, Moesia, and Pannonia to his banner. The only problem was their distance comparatively to Vitellius and his much more closer Rhine legions. Summoning all the forces he could, Otho stood against Vitellius at Bedriacum. 
This battle was decisive and Lotho was soundly defeated in the field. Despite controlling a large army, with considerable forces still en route to aid his cause, Otho saw a long, bloody civil war and many more of his countrymen dead at his hands. He took the honorable way out, falling on his sword to avoid further bloodshed, and ended the civil war before it spiraled out of control. Or so he thought. Vitellius was now the sole emperor of the Roman Empire. Completing his march to Rome, Vitellius, a famous glutton, feasted. A lot. Parades. Banquets. It was time to party in Rome. Nero had brought the empire to financial ruin, a problem which both Galba and Otho had wrestled with in their short reigns. Now, carefree and in a great mood, Vitellius was treading on dangerous waters with a nearly exhausted state treasury. Yet as the new emperor and his legions took their victory lap, the eyes of the empire turned east. While Vitellius continued to spend his empire into insolvency, Vespasian weighed his options. The well-respected commander of the East had not gotten involved in the year's political chaos, keeping his head low and waiting to see how things played out in Italia, still busy fighting the first Jewish war that he had been tasked with. It was not Vespasian who decided to become emperor, however, rather the legions of Egypt and Judea that wanted him to take the throne from the hands of Vitellius. Elevated by his men, Vespasian made his plans to march west and take the throne for himself, leaving his son Titus behind to continue to fight the war. Vespasian marched west with a huge army towards his destiny. However, he never really needed to do much of anything. The legions of Raetia and Moesia effectively won the war for him. These forces sent to reinforce Otho arrived long before Vespasian could even reach Italia. These legions, commanded by Marcus Antonius Primus, invaded Italy and headed straight for Rome, bent on avenging Otho and removing Vitellius from power. Vitellius' supporters melted away as the legions arrived outside of the city. Fleeing into hiding, he was captured and killed. There was now only Vespasian, the sole ruler of the empire. The year of the four emperors was over. This running battle royale had now reached its murderous climax, and only a single man remained. Last to enter the contest, Vespasian would go on to establish the Flavian dynasty and return a measure of stability to Rome, ruling for a decade. It was Vespasian who commissioned the Colosseum of Rome, still today its most famous landmark, completed by his son Titus after his death. I hope you've enjoyed this short little summary of the Year of the Four Emperors. To support the channel, please click the like, comment, and subscription buttons. Plus, follow me on Twitter, at HadronTV, to be kept in the loop on our future videos. Thanks for watching.